Hello, everybody. Welcome. We are thrilled that you could join us today for On Sexualization and Society. My name is Alex Elliott. I'm the Senior Manager of Events and Engagement for the Public Programs Department of California Institute of Integral Studies, a nonprofit university in San Francisco. As many of us are descendants of settlers, immigrants, or descendants of those who were forcefully brought to this continent, we, CIIS Public Programs, must recognize and never forget that our university's building in San Francisco occupies traditional, unceded Ramaytush Ohlone lands. If you're interested in learning more about native lands, languages, and territories, we encourage you to visit native-land.ca. Now, let me first introduce our presenters, Julia Serrano and Abini Jones, and then we will get right to their conversation. Abini Jones is a writer and editor whose work has appeared in Autostraddle, Fast Company, Travel and Leisure, Travel Weekly, Them, The Washington Post, and other online publications. Her work primarily focuses on LGBTQ plus issues, especially literature and travel, and she has a particular interest in exploring the nuances of how trans women show up in and move through the world. She's based in Portland, Oregon. Julia Serrano is the author of four books, including the acclaimed modern classic, Whipping Girl. Her writing has been published in the New York Times, The Guardian, Time, Salon, Miss, and Bitch Media. She holds a PhD in biochemistry from Columbia University and lives in Oakland, California. And now it is my absolute pleasure to turn it over to Aveni and Julia. Hi, Julia, how are you? Hello, happy to be here. Um, so, uh, I am also really happy to be here and I'm excited to be having this conversation with you. I appreciate you for doing it and for writing this excellent book. Um, the first thing that I would like to ask you is what briefly is this book about and why did you want to write about this topic? Sure, it, um, I would say the book more broadly is about um, sex and sexuality. And usually when people write about sex and sexuality, um, they frame them as things that people are or that they possess or that they do. And I was very interested and have been for quite a long time in how we perceive and interpret these facets of people and our world. And um, in particular, when I transitioned from male to female back in the early 2000s, um, and people tend to get very focused on trans people's experiences of like, you know, people being fascinated about how we change our transitions or transformations. And for me, it was kind of the opposite. It was the thing that was really fascinating to me was how much the world changed around me. As soon as people started reading me as a woman rather than a man, uh, they just started making all sorts of different assumptions and projecting expectations and meanings onto me. And so I talk about that in the book. Um, so that's a big part of it, looking into those double standards about why we project certain sexual meanings and motives onto some people, but not others. Uh, but the part that was most intense for me, as far as double standards go, was uh, experiencing sexualization. And so, as one can imagine, I began to experience a lot of the forms of sexualization that young women in our culture tend to face, and that feminists have long discussed, you know, such as um, objectification and slut shaming, sexual harassment, um, and all the way to se outright sexual violence. And a lot of what past feminists have said about that um, resonated with me and helped me kind of understand those experiences. But then I had all these other experiences where people knew that I was a trans, knew that I was transgender and saw me as a trans woman rather than a cisgender woman. And in those cases, I found that I was also sexualized but in different ways. So people would view me as a, a sexual predator or sexually deviant or promiscuous. 
or they view me as undesirable or as exotic or as a fetish object. And all of these different forms of sexualization share the fact that a person is reduced to just being a sexual being. And that in our culture tends to have a degrading or delegitimizing effect on people. And so I wanted to understand that and, and present all forms of sexualization to try to show how they're interconnected and to try to find ways of challenging it um, that will foster sexual equity um, without sacrificing sexual difference in the process. Hmm. Well, some of the kind of that process you describe of sexualization, right? It's that you were discussing like the projection of assumptions and meanings and, and identities and ideas onto people. Um, there are a few mindsets and ideologies that you describe in the book that um, kind of form the foundation of that sexualization that you describe, both that happens to all of us, but particularly you're, you were just discussing cis women, and then there's kind of a, a slightly different and alternate type of sexualization that occurs uh, for trans women and for other people in society. The One of the first ideas that you really discuss in the book is this idea that men and women as categories are opposite and that and you use a filing cabinet analogy can you discuss that a little bit and explain what you mean with that analogy sure yeah um those are the first two mindsets i talk about in the book so it's the two filing cabinets mindset and the um, opposites mindset and together they make up what most of us would call the gender binary but i found it's useful to talk about them somewhat separately so the the two filing cabinets mindset is the fact that um, I have had this experience, other people have had this experience, where particularly when I was at sort of the, the so-called in-between point in my transition, um, rather than people viewing me as gender ambiguous and not being able to understand who I was and being confused and saying, are you a boy or are you a girl, which I would occasionally get, but that wasn't usually what I experienced. What I mostly experienced was people either reading me as male or reading me as female, but not one or the other. And as soon as people do that, they a they tend to filter out all this other stuff about you. So um, someone who would read me as a woman uh, wouldn't tend tended not to notice aspects about me that were male or masculine, um, and vice versa. Um, and so this is something we do. And I also uh, cite research that's been done into how we categorize people according to gender. Um, so I think that that's useful. That we basically put people in one cabinet or the other, and it's it's really hard for us to think about there being any overlap whatsoever. And then the opposites mindset is just the idea that we tend to view, um, in this case, uh, we, we not only view gender dichotomously, but we assume that they're opposite. So these are ideas that we're very, uh, we're very used to hearing, like the idea that men are strong and women are weak, or that men are active and women are passive, or that, um men are practical while women are like frivolous or ornamental and so on and so on in the, in the book i have a the table of opposites that kind of lists a lot of these popular um presumptions and we all know that that isn't true that there's strong women and weak men or that you know you know no person is like completely passive or completely active right Th these are just very clearly opposites but they very much inform a lot of the meanings and particularly the sexual meanings that we project onto women and men. So the idea that men are active and women are passive um, really plays a, a, a foundational role in how we kind of consider how sex is supposed to happen, that like men are the active party and women are the passive party who, women, who men act upon, right? Um, and that was a lot of why I wanted to put that in there. And I should also say that the opposite mindset also works. We tend to view different types of groups dichotomously. Um, and when we do that, we tend to often project opposites on them. And sometimes these opposites overlap somewhat with the ones we project on the maleness versus femaleness. And other times there are different sets. Um, but in all cases, they're kind of these unconscious meanings that we project onto people. Yeah, I've always thought that it's the, the idea that men and women are opposite is really prevalent in our culture, and it's kind of bizarre, but we do so much of that 
kind of like thinking to the degree that a lot of people think that like cats and dogs are opposite, for example, instead of thinking that they're just like different in the same way that they're both animals or whatever. It's a similar men and women are also maybe they have there's some observable difference or something, but the idea that they're opposite is actually kind of bizarre. Um, but one of the things yeah, that and, you- and, and I, I'm glad you brought up, oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I was just going to add, I'm glad you brought up cats and dogs because not only do people see cats and dogs as opposites, but a lot of people kind of gender cats as feminine and dogs as masculine. Yeah. So this yeah. is kind of the infectious way that like these meanings can kind of get out there and shape the way we see the world, even though if we step back, we realize that's not a rational outlook. Yeah, and I don't know how I feel about like gendering of my cat, for example, he's male, right? But the vast majority of people when they meet my cat, they'll use the she, her, and her pronouns because that's so prevalent that we think of cats as female and dogs as male. But one of the th ways that this plays out that you describe in the book is like, depending on which filing cabinet someone puts you into in their mind, and there are only generally two options, the man or the woman cabinet, your actions are interpreted differently. And sometimes it's the exact same action, but depending on which category they put you into, they are, like you said, sometimes your actions are just ignored, but other times they're given completely different meaning. Yeah. Um, a common uh, example that I use, and I, I, I mentioned it in the book, is that when I was moving through the world as male, there were certain times where I would get um, assertive or argumentative in a particular situation. And whenever that happened, people might have disagreed with the argument I was making or, or what I was asserting, but they never complained about the fact that I was being assertive. Uh, but then as soon as I transitioned and people start reading me as female, the kind of that exact same behavior, people immediately started, they would call me a bitch, right? Or they would, um, they would presume that it was like my time of the month, right? Even though I don't have time for the month. Um, but but they, they projected it, they assumed that because I was acting atypical, that they would recognize that and name it in a way that it would just be the unaccepted norm when people were reading me as male. Mm -hmm. And one of the most important or powerful, I guess, or pervasive ways that you talk about um, this division and the way things are interpreted is you talk about the predator prey dynamic, that folks who are interpreted to be in the male filing cabinet are expected to and encouraged to be predators when it comes to, or to embody a kind of predator action set of actions or mindset when it comes to sex um, and people who are in the woman filing cabinet are encouraged and expected to be the prey. Um, can you talk a little bit about that dynamic and how that um, kind of plays out and how you discuss that in the book? Sure, yeah. Um, and so I think that these ideas tend to be so common that, that I kind of go out of my way in the book to demonstrate that this is how we view the world and not necessarily how men and women are, right? Even though, you know, anyone can point to examples of, of men who are predatory, right? But, but the idea behind it is that men are seen as sexual initiators or aggressors, and women are the sexual objects that men pursue and desire. And one way in which this plays out is in the sexual script that we're all kind of taught, we all Nobody ever like sat down and taught this to me, but just from watching movies and watching the world around me as a child, being socialized in our culture, I just understood that this is how things are supposed to work, um, as do most of us. And the idea is that, well, the man is the aggressor, the pursuer, so he makes the first move and all subsequent moves. Um, and so he acts, whereas the woman reacts, and she can react by either um, accepting or acquiescing to his, um, to his moves, or she can, uh, she can try to fend him off or, or you know, try to, to stop him in his tracks, right? And so this is the kind of the unwritten I idea of how sex and sexuality is supposed to play out in our culture. And it has a lot of really bad ramifications, um, many of which feminists have, have long discussed. So one is if, if women are the objects who are pursued, um, they're not seen as having sexual agency or desires 
of our own, right? Um, so, so that's a really uh, big thing. Um, if a woman does try to assert herself, um, instead of viewing her as legitimately acting on her own desires, um, instead she's seen as opening her up to be sexualized opening yourself up to be sexualized by other people, right? So if a woman does try to make the first move, people will call her easy, right? Which means that she makes it easy for other people to get what they want from her, right? Which is a really horrible idea. And this is um, kind of opens the door to a lot of uh, slut shaming and a lot of assumptions behind that. Um, so th those are some of the aspects that are really bad. It also makes it really hard for us to recognize that. So um, in the US, statistics show that 25% of all boys and men experience um, sexual violence at some point in their lives, which is an astonishing number when you think about how little we talk about that. Um, and not only do we not talk about that much, often we talk about it as a joke, right? So you see anytime that there's a news story about um, an adult woman and an adolescent uh, or teenage boy, um, instead of discussing it as statutory rape, people will make jokes about, oh, well, he was lucky, right? He wasn't, he, he wasn't actually raped. Because it's like really hard for us to, that with the predator prey mindset, we, it's almost as if we don't have the language or framework to really seriously um, discuss uh, these discrepancies. And so one of the things that you brought up just now is that of a lot of these mindsets seem they're incredibly pervasive most of us don't have to be taught them we're just enculturated into them via our society and part of the rationale for that for a lot of people is that they are human nature or evolutionary or normal or natural you're a biologist so how do you respond to the idea when people or when people point to things like parental investment theory or when they point to evidence that shows that these types of mindsets or these types of behaviors are natural. Yeah, I mean, I, so when I when I discuss this and I, I towards the end of the book, my book is mostly not a biology book, even though I am a biologist. But at the end, I kind of bring up this idea the parental investment theory. I think everyone is probably familiar with it, even if you don't know what that means. But that it's this idea that um, since men make sperm um, and sperm is uh, very resource um, inexpensive and men make a lot of sperm. So it's in kind of biologically men's interests to like spread all their sperm all over the place um, as in as much as possible. Whereas uh, for females of a, a species, I should say that this is um, these ideas are thought to be like for all sex species and not just for, for human beings. Um, but, uh, and in the case of females, since eggs are um, more resource heavy, and especially when you add pregnancy into that, that it's in females, like they're biologically driven to, um, to be very picky or um, Charles Darwin, I think used the word coy. People talk about like women are coy and men are eager. Um, I think is kind of the language he used. Um, and so they kind of want to be very selective and just want to find, you know, the person, the man with the right genes, um, which people talk about that, but like without really much uh, consideration of, of what those genes might be or. Um, so anyway, so this idea is out there and there's some evidence for it, but there's lots of exceptions to the rule and um, particularly once you start talking about human beings, it becomes particularly strange in that we have all these sexual meanings and really obvious social regulations. So if you are a woman who kind of wants to have a lot of sex, people will stigmatize you for that, right? Um, or if you, are a, a, if you are a queer person who doesn't want to have like, you know, procreative sex with someone of the other sex, you want to kind of have sex, you know, with the same sex partner um, that like that's not even really in consideration. So these are all like exceptions that um, aren't really explained um, by this. And I think also just on a human being level, like I don't think most people, I, most women I know when they have sexual desires, 
um, or have an interest in like having sex with someone and let's just stick with the, in this case, a man, right? Um, there's not usually a lot of talk about like, um, oh, the good genes, right? <laughs> and even though men are supposed to want to like um, have sex really promiscuously um, with anyone they can, in real life, actually, a lot of men are very selective about who they have sex with. So it's just, these ideas don't really play out in actual, in our lives. And so while I don't discount that there could be some role there, I think it, particularly when you're talking about human beings where we have all these social norms and, and these roles we're supposed to play, right? Like the idea of like the feminine woman and the masculine man, these are roles that have all these different expectations um, that we need to follow. And once you start coloring outside of the lines, um, you will very easily be shamed for that um, or ostracized for that. So I, I don't doubt that biology is at work. And as someone who, uh, who physically transitioned, who went on hormones, I would say that hormones do very real things, very real biological things. Um, but the focus of my book is on how we perceive and interpret sex, gender, and sexuality and I think a lot of the way that we interpret the world um, is more based on these mindsets and certain social meanings that we've just been enculturated to buy into often without giving them much thought. Well, one of the things that you just brought up is stigma. Um, and, you know, the ways that um, we behave generally, it seems to me like that stigma, um, is related to whether or not people's behavior aligns with those mindsets that you were discussing. Like if you're a mas like you said, if you're a masculine man, if you're a man who fulfills the predator kind of stereotype in terms of how you do sex, if your objects of desire are legitimate, they're legitimated by our society or our system, then you're good to go. And then if you deviate from that script, then you face policing shame and stigma. And I'm really curious to, uh, I was really interested in the way that you have articulated stigma or the concept of it in the book um, that you, one of the ways you discuss it is, is, or you talk about how it functions almost like a contagion or like an infectious disease. Like if someone's stigmatized, then by association or, th or contact with them, you can be stigmatized by association. Um, and it can stick to certain people, but it doesn't stick to other people. Can you talk a little bit about stigma and how you see that functioning with respect to the sexualization that you discussed throughout the book? Sure, yeah. Um, when I first started writing the book, and my outline of the book very much um, coincides with how the book turned out, except for the one thing that kind of surprised me as I went along, stigma became more and more an important part of it. Um, I think, and I think most of us are familiar with stigma in terms of shame. Like if, um, you know, we feel, for instance, in my case, I grew up feeling personal shame about being transgender, being queer. Um, and, you know, most marginalized groups are stigmatized um, in various ways or to varying extents. So, there's that aspect of it, but I found that stigma is really built into how we're socialized to think about sex and particularly the predator prey mindset. It's, it's built into that. Um, I'll explain in a second why that is. And um, it, I think it explains why sex and sexuality are such taboo um, aspects of our culture. Um, so for instance, uh, one aspect of predator prey is that um, women are seen as having or being sex, whereas men are not considered to be sex. They are people who take sex or pursue sex, right? Um, which is why a, in, a, in most cases or in a lot of like canonical cases, um, men don't really face sexualization that much. Whereas with, since women are sex, um and we see sex as bad we see sex itself as like stigmatized and this is why like these ideas that women are supposed to cover up their sex um if too much of their sex is revealed whether that's rumors about them sleeping around or whether that's 
um, like we see in the case of like revenge porn, et cetera, um, then, then there's stigma associated with that. And this idea of sex and stigma being associated is also very, very common in sexual minorities. So if you are, um, uh, a, you know, a sex worker, or if you have a sexually transmitted disease, or if you're just, if you're simply gay, there's often stigma attached to it. And that stigma is viewed as like permanent, like you're kind of like permanently affected by that. So even if you you quit doing sex work and get your STD cured and or you you stop having same sex relationships, people still view you as like permanently marked by that. And it was as I was working on that is where I got to notice not only that stigma was playing a big role, but also in reading about stigma, um, there's a lot of research about how stigma is viewed as a type of contagion. And so this is like a magical sort of thinking, meaning it's not like, it's not like the ger germ disease uh, model that we have that's based on science. This is like magical thinking where we assume that something that we view as negative, that if it comes into contact with something else, that it like permanently corrupts or contaminates um, that other thing. And you can see this come up all the time in the way that like, you know, women are pure when they're virgins, but then as soon as they have sex, people will describe them as being used or ruined by the event. Um, uh, we can see this a lot right now in this world where um, there's a lot of anti-LGBTQ plus um, activism and politics out there. Um, and the language that supposedly um, adult LGBTQ plus people are like corrupting children, the way in which the idea of grooming, which um, gets used by these kind of right wing people in a way that's very different from kind of useful ways of talking about grooming with regards to preventing child sexual abuse. Um, they use it in this way that just kind of means that like, you know, in their eyes, queer people um, are just like filled with stigma and anything we touch, like even just seeing us walking down the street holding hands or even a, a pride flag in a classroom has like this magical ability to corrupt children in their minds. Um, you just can knowing that like we that. exist is like going to infect children. Yeah, with, exactly. With the Garcudis, essentially. Yep. Yes, exactly. And then one last way in which that ties in um, in the book, I talk about um, the, the fetish mindset, which I call it, um, which is this idea that some people in our society are deemed undesirable. Um, and so I, th this happens to a lot of marginalized groups. I use the example of me being trans. A lot of people will assume that I'm undesirable, even though they also assume that I'm very hypersexual. So in their minds, I'm having lots of sex, but nobody wants to have sex with me, which I've never really understood how they square that in their minds. But anyway, uh, um, if you're seen as undesirable, then if someone does find you attractive, people call that a fetish. Um, and I describe the many reasons why this is kind of bad pathological language and how it's wrong in many ways. But sometimes when you're viewed as undesirable, people get disgusted thinking about having sex with you. And actually uh, contagion, the idea of contagion and the idea of stigma are very closely associated with feelings of disgust. Mm -hmm. And in reading papers that kind of connected all these dots um, for me, um, it was really helpful for me to kind of connect the stigma of like, not just someone having sex with me because I'm queer and them being viewed as being contaminated by that, but also other people's senses of disgust about the idea of having sex with a trans person or some other marginalized group. Um, that they have been taught is supposedly undesirable. Um, so yeah, it ended up being a very central part of the book in a way, in ways that I couldn't have imagined when I first started working on it. Yeah, it seemed uh, one of the things that you discuss is how, like you were just saying, that some people or some things or objects are considered legitimate objects of desire and others are considered illegitimate objects of desire and you see this play or you describe you discuss in the book how this plays out across all different axes intersectional axes of identity or what 
category, right? That like, whether it's people of a certain size or people with a certain disability or people of a certain race, that is considered a not a legitimate object of desire. So there's got to be something suspect about that desire. And so that then means that that desire is stigmatized. Is that kind of, that's what you're describing, right? Yeah, definitely. That's, that's it. And the idea that, for instance, someone who is, um, so groups such as I, I mentioned trans people, but um, people with disabilities and fat people have described very similar, um, very similar experiences of um, people attracted to them being called like having a fetish, right? Um, because supposedly no one should find them attractive. Um, but we don't call people who are attracted to cisgender people or, or thin people or, um, or able-bodied people. We don't say that, that people have like able-bodied fetishes, even if they only date people who are able-bodied, right? So there's like an obviously, there's an obvious uh, asymmetry to the way these things get used. Mm -hmm. And then I also describe how sometimes for some groups, uh, if the stigma goes down a little bit um, and it becomes more acceptable for people to be attracted to you, then it kind of plays into what has also been called the exoticization of the other, um, which is when people like uh, they find marginalized groups, you know, fascinating and exotic. And uh, this plays out a lot. And this also gets called fetishization, right? Like, so people will talk about um, men who have like, you know, Asian fetishes, right? Um, and they can play out in somewhat different ways for different groups. Um, I want to make clear, as I do in the book, that because a lot of these same dynamics are happening for different marginalized groups, I'm not insinuating that we all experience the exact same thing, <laughs> um, because we don't. There are very different histories and different stereotypes, et cetera, associated with each group. But um, there are definitely these ways in which um, people of color are often viewed as exotic. Um, in ways that are different from, but also sort of mirror the ways in which, you know, like trans people are seen as exotic. Um, and so a lot of this, I, th I think, is related to ideas of stigma and also the idea that certain people are marked and seem remarkable to us in ways that people who are considered the norm are, are viewed as unmarked. So. Um, yeah. I was actually going to ask you about that, that you talk in the book about marketness. I was, could you say a little bit more about what you mean by that and how that operates? Sure. Yeah. And so, and I think stigma and marketness are, are um, closely associated in a way that I'll explain in a second. But, um, and the idea of, of marketness, um, or in the book I refer to as the unmarked marked mindset, um, is it's not something I invented. It's something that has long been discussed particularly in sociology and, and other humanities, where whatever we consider to be normal, and this will differ from person to person, whatever we consider to be normal or taken for granted is viewed as unmarked, right? And um, whereas if something strikes us as different or as unusual or atypical, it will be marked in our eyes. And we tend to pay things or people that are marked um, way more attention and way more scrutiny. And uh, so in the case of marginalized groups, marginalized groups are generally marked compared to the unmarked dominant majority group. Um, and this can also play out, it's not necessarily a matter of one group being more populous and the other group being a minority because women are marked relative to men in our culture, right? So one, uh, one example is that in our culture, um, you know, if, if something is specific to women, we put the word woman on it, right? So it becomes like, you know, women's reproductive health, but we don't really talk about men's reproductive health. Or we talk about um, women's literature or chick flicks, right? Whereas other movies are just assumed to be for men, right? Um, it's the way in which you become the default. Um, and so groups or individuals who are marked tend to face undue scrutiny and attention. Um, and this comes into play, I argue, a lot of, uh, with regards to street harassment, um, uh, this comes into play. And it's the idea that uh, when you're marked, 
because people view you as like screaming for attention, they assume that like you're asking for whatever attention you get. Um, and that gets twisted in a lot of bad ways with regards to sexual harassment. Um, and then I would say that stigma, the way that I describe it in the book is that um, stigma tends to impact marked groups. So not all marked groups are stigmatized. So like one example would be if you're a celebrity, you're marked, you're seen as special. And there's all these horrible ways that we treat celebrities where we think that they're screaming out for attention. We assume that they're, uh, that it's okay to like interrupt their day, um, et cetera. Um, but they're not stigmatized. They're viewed as like marked in a way that they're seen as special, right? Um, so not all marked people are stigmatized but usually if stigma is involved, it impacts uh, marked groups uh, particularly. Um, yeah, it seems like I, one of the questions that I was considering or thinking about was um, the way that markedness, I guess, plays out in that, and one of the ways that it plays out in sexualization is the what you were discussing, kind of sex shaming. Uh, that primarily impacts women, right? Like the, if a woman has sex, she is marked for life. You know, I remember when I was a young person, I got the analogy from my church leaders that like every time you have sex, or you're like a flower, and every time you have sex, there's a, you know, a petal ripped off of it, and soon enough you'll just be an empty stem, and who would want to marry that or whatever? And it was primarily directed at women, right? With a men can have as much sex as they want. Um, so the the same act, and this is kind of goes back to what you were describing, that this is part of the opposites mindset, the file cabinet, filing cabinet mindset, that depending on which category you're in, the same act has a different meaning. And when it comes to sexualization, um, that that's one of the primary ways it operates is there's, I guess, you know, like you said, a double standard that you do something, it means one thing, but if you do something, it means something else. And there's an expectation of how you're supposed to move through the world with respect to those kind of uh, meanings, those sexual, you talk a lot, you talk in the book about your kind of framework for thinking about this is, is a sexual elements or sexual meanings kind of framework or mindset for thinking about, it kind of wraps all of this up into a, a framework. Can you describe a little bit about that, that sexual elements and meanings framework? Sure, yeah. Um, and, and just before I do that, I'll just mentioned something that that uh, that coincides with what you're talking about. Um, a lot of times when people are marked, we we pay them more attention and more scrutiny. And a lot of times, and, and also because we think that people who are marked must be doing it for some reason, they're screaming out for intention, they're inviting mm -hmm. our attention. Um, we assume that there are motives a lot of times. And so because of that, a lot of times people who are marked um, often have sexual motives projected onto them or aspects about their bodies or their behaviors that are not any more sexual than anyone else's are seen as excessively sexual. And I talk about how that plays out, particularly for a lot of different marginalized groups and especially for groups that are multiply marginalized um, who are seen as like especially conspicuous or et cetera. Um, so it plays out in all sorts of ways with regards to that. Um, with regards to the uh, sexual elements and meanings framework, that was a way for me to explain um, kind of aspects of how we see, okay, there's sexual diversity in that all of us have somewhat different sexual palettes, much like we have different like taste palettes, right? And I, I make this analogy quite a bit because I think uh, tastes and 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 sex have obvious common things in that you know like being able to taste food is important for sustenance and um, sex is important for reproduction. But mostly in our culture, when we think about food or sex, we think more about it in terms of pleasure. And so there's a lot of diversity and a lot of the ways in which sexologists um, and other people. Uh, you know, view sex tends to be in very patholog pathological ways that there's normal sex and then there's weird sex, um, uh, which are often called 
I already said the word fetishes, but like the word paraphernalia, uh, not paraphernalia, paraphilia is often used um, to just assume that certain types of sex are, are wrong. Like if you had sex with me, like there's a paraphilia word to describe that, that somebody invented, right? Um, and I think it's more important to realize that there are certain sexual um, meanings, there are certain sexual elements that are things that maybe aren't the person we're attracted to, but also serve as kind of like um, turn-ons to us. And it's a way to talk about these meanings. A, we kind of inherit a set of meanings from our culture and a lot of people buy into those, but sometimes we deviate from those and deviate has strong negative connotations because of the idea of sexual deviation. So let me say we vary from those often, right? Um, and then also sometimes we recognize that there are certain hierarchies in our culture, such as predator prey, but there are other hierarchies um, that may inform our sexualities or, um, you know, like if you are, um, if you're a woman in our culture, you might find it erotic, the idea of a man who like, um, well, you, you wouldn't want at all for a man to like, uh, to engage in sexual violence without your consent. Um, the idea of kind of romanticized idea of like the, the perfect, like ideal sexual aggressor man, like this is the Sean Connery and James Bond movies or, or whatever action hero who like, uh, you know, there's a way that you can have like kind of uh, a romanticized or eroticized idea of like that as a partner or a situation that you wouldn't necessarily want to have in real life. And so once we realize these different meanings um, and that they can vary from person to person and that um, again, as long as we're not engaging in these ideas non-consensually, I talk about this a lot with regards to sexual fantasies, um, that yeah, I mean, so basically just a way to describe sexual diversity in a way that is ethically sexual and that it's not non-consensually involving others, but also um, understands that there is a lot of sexual diversity out there that stems from us projecting different meanings onto different people and uh, different other aspects, um, adjacent aspects. Well, I feel like the food analogy is so apt with regards to that idea of sexual meanings being projected onto different behaviors or different actions around diversity, right? Because you talk about in the book how very few of us, or in, in the vast majority of cases, we don't stigmatize someone having a different taste in food than us. We might be interested or curious or, and you know, some people do try to police other people's taste in food. Um, a lot of us probably, or especially folks who are maybe immigrants experience that in the lunchroom as a kid but um but generally speaking it doesn't happen but it, the end um you kind of use that analogy to talk to, to, to discuss how all the wide variety of ways that people men do sexuality are but we could view them as just as benign as the many varied ways that people have taste in food and we even talk about it in the same way like you said like we say what's your taste in men or women, right? Mm -hmm. We could view it as just as benign, uh, but instead we project a bunch of meanings and assumptions onto different people's different tastes in sex. Um, and that's not necessarily inherent. It's not tr like true. It's just arbitrary and created in most cases. Obviously there are, like you said, cases of non-consensuality. It's um, different, but in most cases it's, we could decide not to do that decide not to project negative um, meanings onto certain consensual acts of sex. Yeah, um, yeah, I mean, the, the, when I talk about uh, meetings with regards to food, it's like, if you think about food, like, there's just, it's not as simple as, oh, there's food I find tasty and food that I, I, I dislike. Often, like, different foods mean different things to you, right? So if I were to say, you know, oh, I had champagne and caviar last night for dinner, you might say, oh, what were you celebrating, right? Um, or, you know, you could have something like a, a communion wafer, right? Um, 
that is imbued with all sorts of meanings that go well beyond the actual literal piece of food, <laughs> um, right? Uh, and we did this with a lot of things. You know, there could be like a, a meal that's very special to you because you used to have it as a kid, um, or it's from the the town you grew up in. Um, all sorts of things. And so recognizing that some of your experiences with meanings and food will be different. Um, recognizing that um, different meanings about like, you know, like what you find attractive or um, in people or, um, you know, things along those lines, then you can more easily recognize that, oh, well, you could appreciate a different type of person than me or find something erotic that I don't find erotic. And there's not necessarily anything uh, wrong with that, right? And again, it's like getting away from the idea that um, solitary and consensual sexuality, um, that it's not, uh, it doesn't inherently fall into good and bad, right and wrong categories. Um, I also talk a lot in the book about um, as a way to kind of moderate between the sex positive, sex negative, um uh stances uh which i definitely fall way more in the sex positive side of of those two but talking about um kind of having ambivalent views about sex and sexuality and which i think is also important like recognizing that um we can have mixed feelings about certain things so there might be something that makes us feel somewhat negative but also um, we might be somewhat attracted to it too, right? Um, and I think that that's good to help help us make sense to work through kind of what it is that we're experiencing, what we want and what we don't want, um, these sorts of conversations that we don't really have a whole lot in our culture where um, there's just this assumption that this is how you're supposed to do it and anything that deviates is wrong. And yeah, for sure, definitely. And one of the things that comes up for me with thinking about that is that it seems like the primary difference, like that we're, we don't want to put sex into this is good or this is legitimate or this is acceptable and this isn't. But the 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 kind of line is around consent. And to me, it seems like when I was reading your book that the primary difference between sexuality and sexualization is consent that if we were to freely choose to engage in, let's say, a predator-prey dynamic with our partner, because maybe that's a BDSM scene we're doing, or maybe that's just, I'm a bottom and she's a top or whatever, or, or whatever, <laughs> um, that would be fine, right? If it's freely, totally consensual, if those are like choices that we make with complete, infinite power and agency to choose whatever we want. The problem is the compulsory nature of the script that you described. But you also talk a little bit in the book about the limits of consent as a principle. So how doesn't consent really get at the heart of the issue? Yeah, I think that um, there has been a, a, there has been a focus because we live in a world where um, most people don't have the experience of having in-depth sex education or going to like um, classes or or whatever where there's discussions of sexual diversity um, because we lack that um, a lot of people grow up particularly I, I mean i grew up in this world where you just assume that predator prey is how it works and men are like this and women are like this and this is how it's supposed to happen and the predator prey script it's like it's it's all like really pretty much all mapped out, right? Like what is supposed to happen. And consent is really crucial. Um, and uh, the feminist focus on consent, initially, like, like it used to be when I was growing up, people would say no means no, right? Which is a way to stress that if a woman says no, then she's not consenting and then it's not consensual, that's bad, right? Um, which is something people had to be told because part of, the, the sexual aggressor male script is that he's supposed to keep pushing and pushing further and further um, until she acquiesces, right? So, and then more recently, there's been the affirmative consent that, you know, the woman should enthusiastically consent, which is good. Like, 
both parties should be enthusiastic about what they're going to do, right? Um, so I'm all for consent is crucial and enthusiastic consent is really good. Um, but if there's no discussion about the fact that there are these built-in roles and rules and the script that everyone's supposed to follow, then if you're only talking about consent, then it's still kind of going to be by default on a predator prey framework, right? Um, and this is something as a as a queer woman, um, like in in my experiences dating other LGBTQIA plus people, that um, that there's often discussions <laughs> about what it is that you want and like or what what are your boundaries or not. I'm not saying that absolutely every instance of like queer sex is is perfectly negotiated and communicated but for a lot of us it's not really clear who's in what role and it's not necessarily clear that like oh well i'm a woman so i must want this or you know they're a man so they must want that you know especially if you know the person you're dating is non-binary or if they just are diverse gender or sexually in other ways um so there almost has to be some communication and discussion about boundaries and likes and dislikes. And that is something that I'm very used to now that when I was growing up, there was like none of that. So if you don't have those discussions, then consent in and of itself is going to fall short. Um, it's, it's not, uh, it's crucial, but it's um, not a panacea on its own. It's like, I guess like if we, focus too much on consent it's kind of like there's the script and you can consent or not to the script but that doesn't necessarily challenge the primacy of the script itself kind of right yeah exactly and and like part of the whole script the predator prey script is that by definition certain things are in the book i describe it as off the menu which means you have to ask for it and so people might do that if they want something like that's that's a little bit different from kind of sex that leads up to like man on top, woman on bottom, missionary position, penetration sex, like outside of that, then there might be some discussions about, oh, would you be interested in this or that? But usually there's only a couple things that are considered okay to ask for. Um, it doesn't take too much to, 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 to uh, reach a point where what you're asking for is going to be considered weird or sick or perverted right yeah well i'm realizing we're getting close to the end of time I, what i had wanted to do was talk a bit more about towards the end of the book you get into like well how what do we do right so how do we address this issue we've just spent the last 45 minutes or so um exploring and describing and you um kind of identify essentially like three main ways that we can move toward more ethical sexuality and the first one is rejecting non-consensuality and which is, I guess, essentially like being, which I wonder if I can kind of encapsulate in a short phrase or something like that. But so much of how we view sex and sexuality is by projecting meanings or ideas or assumptions onto people and how they should or shouldn't behave sexually. And that's not without and that denies their humanity and agency because it's not consensual. The, um, we tell people how they should be instead of having people be free to do whatever. Um, is that close to, like, my yeah. question I guess is like, how do we reject non-consensuality? Sure, yeah. Um, when I discuss that, um, I definitely make a point of moving beyond just like, obviously we should reject non-consensuality meaning if someone doesn't consent to something, then it shouldn't happen, right? That is is clear. I think most people understand that. Um, but I kind of extend it to, um, and there's this idea that I, I, I borrow and I discuss earlier in the book um, from a, a feminist philosopher named Anne Cahill um, called derivatization. And that may sound like a lie. It's, I think it sounds confusing at first, but if most people are familiar with the term objectification, and uh, so imagine taking objectification, removing the word object and putting in the word derivative, so it's derivatization, 
And she uses this, I think, in really useful ways to, to first get over some bad ideas that are kind of built into the idea of um, objectification, specifically, um, there can be positive ways in which you can feel objectified by your partner consensually, right? And there are, there are other philosophical issues with objectification. But derivatization, she uses it to mean uh, when we view somebody else as a derivative of our own desires and wants and needs. So, and it's really useful for talking about the idea of like fetishization, like one issue with people being attracted to me as a trans woman, not all people, but there are a subset of people who they're attracted to me as a trans woman, but only because they project these ideas about what a trans woman is that kind of completely conflict with my own understanding of myself. And so I think it's really important for us to not derivatize people. And so I put that under reject non-consensuality. So we should reject the idea of pursuing sex with people based on the idea that they are going to be the thing that we desire without regard to their own agency, autonomy, and desires. Um, so yeah, that's an important part of rejecting non-consensuality. Totally. Um, one of the second ways that you talk about trying to move toward ethical sexuality is deconstructing or rejecting the good sex versus bad sex binary, which I think we talked about a little bit. But I want to ask you about the final way is that you argue that we should self-examine our own sexual desires. Um, and basically to like try to do some introspection to determine, well, to what degree do my own sexual desires align with that script or with, you know, maybe oppressive dynamics within our culture or maybe with, you know, uh, misogynist beliefs or with racist belief, you know, et cetera. We should be just critical about ourselves because yes, some of it is authentic, but of our sexualities are impacted by our enculturation, right? Um, and so my question about that is like, how far should we go? Like, what does it look like to self-examine your sexual desires? For example, like we were just talking about um, someone, if someone's attracted to trans women, it feels different when they're attracted to you and you are a trans woman versus when they're attracted to you because you're a trans woman. But the other flip side to that too is when people are not attracted to someone because they're a trans woman. Um, and to what degree, like, what if you, I guess my question is like, what if you self-examine your desires and you find that they potentially authentically conform to an oppressive social norm or something like that? So I guess my question is like, how far can we go in examining our own desires and is it necessarily problematic if we find that they um like i say conform to one of the mindsets from we that we talked about at the beginning or if they conform to some standard um that if it were compulsory it would be problematic but if it's feels like authentic then it it may it's tricky yeah um like a, i think a quintessential uh um, example of this, I think, is, and I, I've read a lot of feminists who are like sex positive feminists, um, who are women who tend to, who are submissive, sexually submissive, and particularly in cases, obviously not all sexually submissive uh, women are attracted to men, but those who are, then there's this dynamic of what does it mean that I'm this, I'm a feminist, I'm sex positive, I think women should have agency, but what does it mean that I'm in a that I desire to be submissive to a man in a sexual context that is of course consensual, but nevertheless might seem to conflict with, um, you know, or might seem to play into certain hierarchies that you know are bad. And there are a lot of examples of this, and that's like a common one that there's a lot of people have written about it. So I think it's a useful one to think about. Um, I think that it's it's definitely quite possible for people to um, be ethically sexual, even if aspects of their sexuality seems to conform to um, to certain hierarchies or or traditional norms. Um, 
as long as you're critical about it, as long as you're not like projecting that onto other people and assuming other people should also live up to that, um, I think it can definitely be done ethically. And in fact, a lot of I've I've been very much influenced by reading people kind of uh, feminists who have worked through these issues for themselves. Um, but and so obviously, predator prey isn't the only hierarchy you mentioned. You know, like you know, there's racism. There's um, issues about like um, people having different within a relationship. People can have completely different economic power. There could be an economic power disparity, or there could be um, you know relationships where one partner is older than the other, one partner is able-bodied and the other one's disabled. And kind of, I think those of us who've been in relationships, any of those relationships, um, knows that there's a lot of um, kind of working through that and, and not wanting, wanting to be both mutually supportive, um, loving of one another, caring for one another's needs, but at the same time recognizing ways in which hierarchies or disparities can kind of crop up and not letting uh, those shape your experience together. And, and particularly when I was talking about the self-examining desires mostly because we want to get away from policing other people's desires. Again, with the exception of if people are engaging in non-consensual um, sexual activities. Um, aside from that, we shouldn't go around policing other people because of all the reasons that I've talked about. But um, but yeah, so uh, self-examining is hard. You know, you can think about uh, an analogy would be self-examining any aspect of your life. You know, like why? You know, what does it mean that um, that you know I'm doing this job or I, I live my life in this particular way? We often contemplate our aspects of our life and decide whether what we're doing is ethical or not. Um, I think sometimes because sexu sexuality, and particularly with regards to sexual minorities, there's this idea that, oh, well, you know, you're born that way, or we don't get to choose our sexualities, which there is some truth to that for some people in certain cases, but sometimes that gets used as a blanket so that people refuse to do any critical thinking mm. about their sexualities. And I think it's good to do critical thinking. Um, in fact, it's necessary if you want to live in a world where we're ethical, but where we're not having to engage in a lot of uh, policing of solitary and consensual um, sexual experiences. I think that, I, I guess uh, one way to um, think about that is that it, 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 the, the introspection is valuable no matter where we land at the end of it. Right. Like even if we find out like, OK, well, I'm a woman who is heterosexual and I enjoy submissive or I'm attracted to a very assertive and powerful man. And that's just what I'm into. Or like I have a friend who's really into men who have money and they've done a lot of thinking about that. And that's where they've landed, I guess. But the important thing is the the that you do the work to actually think deeply about and interrogate that. And if you land somewhere that you're able to be comfortable with, that's fine. I have one final question for you, though, um, as we wrap up and move soon into the question and answer portion, which is like, we can do a lot of that work, right, internally. We can do this interrogation of our own desires. We can change our thinking patterns and reject the mindsets, reject good versus bad sex. We can reject non-consensuality. But and something that you get into in the book is that that's going to have impact in our own lives. But really, so much of how sexualization functions is it's in a larger society and it's people in power who are and it's in institutions and it's part of the ideology of our culture. And um, a lot of the folks who have maybe harmful attitudes about sex or who believe really deeply in the mindsets and want to impose them on others, they will never they might not probably read this book or be interested in doing that type of introspection. Is there a way that we can move the culture forward um, in a larger sense? Is there something we can do about the bigger picture other than in addition to doing the internal work? Sure, yeah, and that's a, a difficult question. And yeah, I, I talk about this in the last chapter. I 
I think one thing is part of the reason why I put all these out there and I called them mindsets and I gave them names is that a lot of times if you know about a particular pattern of thinking that uh, you can recognize it. So like one example would be like confirmation bias or the gambler's fallacy, which are ideas that a lot of us have heard of. And once you know about it, um, it can make you question your thinking, right? And so I would hope that as these mindsets get more well known that people will absorb them in our culture through osmosis and recognize them as uh, kind of biased ways of, of looking at the world and hopefully try to move beyond them. Um, but, but beside that, um, I do think there are things that we can do with regards to um, destigmatizing um, sex and sexuality and particularly with regards to, to groups who are marginalized. Um, but then also, uh, like one thing I talk about, you know, there's all these examples of people sexualizing other people. Um, and part of the power of sexualizing someone is that it, it kind of knocks them down a peg, whether you call someone, you know, like a queer phobic slur, or you call them a slut, or you call them a pervert, like all these things, they, they affect people. But if you turn that around and you make sex, sexualizing other people the bad thing, um, if people like kind of paid a price for sexualizing mm. other people, then that could create a society where there's less sexualization, um, which which does happen to some degree. Like, you know, like a lot of people now know if, if you call someone a slut, you're going to get pushed back about being sexist. Right. But it usually happens in certain sectors. And I think overall, if we all work to destigmatize sex and sexuality and we work um, to create a world where um, where those kind of acts across the board, where people recognize how all these forms of sexualization are interconnected um, and unhealthy and bad for us as a culture and work to move beyond that, we could hopefully move to a place where there's at least, if sexualization is not completely eliminated, um, at least reduced, um, and at least living in a world where there's more accepting of sexual difference and where there's in a world where there's less sexual violence. So again, yeah, I mean, these are, as with any um, big questions, often it's kind of hard to see how we get there from here, but I definitely think there are some steps that we can take um, towards that ultimate goal. And, and there's so much, um, like I think about the work of Adrienne Marie Brown and like that she talks about like fractals and community and how like, well, maybe we'll just do it ourselves or with our social networks, but then maybe they'll be doing that work with their networks and they're, and it eventually kind of can ripple out until it becomes the norm. And then like you're saying, like the people who are sexualizing are the ones actually getting policed instead of the people who are being sexualized. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much for this lovely conversation. Um, we're, let's move into the question and answer portion of the evening. Um, we've got a few really interesting questions from folks who are currently viewing. Thank you so much. I believe there may still be time to, to send in questions um, if you still have one. I also wanna say before we move to question and answer that there was so much in this excellent book, which you can see I have it right here. Um, that we didn't even get to touch on at all. And so if you're interested in any of these topics, the book is incredible. It is very detailed and very well researched and very all that stuff, but it's also incredibly accessible. You do not need to be a biologist or to already know in depth about all of these issues or you know have a gender studies degree or something to get into this book. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there and encourage folks to pick up the book at your local bookstore, um, or maybe perhaps there are links to a bookshop or something like that within the um, YouTube video uh, that, but I encourage folks to pick up the book and read it. Um, here's a question that I have for you um, from Evan Sweeney. Disabled people are seen as either non-sexual or hypersexual. Disability organizations frequently want disabled folks to be non-sexual because sex gives you autonomy. Do you think this is similar to why people want women not to be the aggressor? 
Yeah, I mean, I'd have to, to, to think through that analogy a bit. Um, definitely what you said, I, I discussed in the book, the ways in which um, uh, people with disabilities are like, it's, it's the flip side of the same coin. You're either um, desexualized, or if you're viewed as sexual, you're, you're viewed as deviantly sexual, right? Um, and other groups face that in, in kind of somewhat different ways. Um, and I feel that there's, the, the thing that immediately comes to my mind is uh, respectability politics that often with marginalized groups, especially around issues of sexuality, um, a lot of us are kind of instructed to, to play down our sexualities because we as a group are seen as excessively sexual. So we're supposed to play down our sexuality. And so, and that definitely obviously happens uh, with women too. Women are supposed to play down their sexuality. And um, so I definitely think that there are connections between uh, these two ideas and specifically how any group that gets um, who's viewed as like marked by sex or excessively sexual um, is encouraged to play down their sexuality in order to gain respectability. And if you deviate from that, then you can, in the eyes of society, be subject to even more sexualization as a result um, because you're asking for it. Um, so yeah, I definitely think that there are connections between those ideas. Something that was interesting to me in that question is it seemed like they were talking a bit about power. And that's, a, I think, an interesting, some, something that you talked about. It's interesting and kind of not logical, most of the ways that a lot of these issues operate, right, or inconsistent, I guess, right, that you're either hypersexual or non-sexual, right? Um, and to some degree, women, you were talked about how women and other groups, not just women, are kind of um, almost made the equivalent of they are sex or they have sex. And to some degree, that gives them power because they're the gatekeeper and at least according to the script, men want sex and women have the power to deny it, right? And so then, but if they take agency over that power, that sex, then they gives them power. And I think that's what they're getting is that's why they want to enforce that women be submissive or be whatever, because if they take charge over their sexualities, that gives them power. And I think that this question asker maybe was making connections between how that plays out with other marginalized groups as well. Does that resonate with you that like it's there's an interesting kind of power dynamic there when it comes to this the predator prey script and um, how that kind of manifests? Yeah, I mean, I definitely I, I definitely agree that there is um, power going on in there. And um, like speaking as a trans woman, um, the way in which people tend to project a lot of sexual stuff onto me and they I was talking about them being fetishized or being viewed as hypersexual because I'm a trans woman. But at the same time, nobody in society wants me to like have my own sexual agency and and do what it is that I would like to do um, on my own terms. So yeah, and I definitely think it's a way, the strange way in which we like sexualize people, but at the same time deny them sexual agency, even though we're also painting them as being hypersexual. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, inconsistent is a very um, a good way of putting that. Um, thank you. Here's another interesting question I have from uh, Sean. Um, they say, I'd be very curious to know how you see the sexualization of trans men in particular, and how you think that differs for trans men compared to your experience of sexist double standards before and after transitioning. Um, and they talk a little bit about their own experience. Um, they say, um, I can think of many examples of trans women being sexualized in the ways you describe, but I cannot think of a time when I've seen a trans man being seen as a real man who could possibly be a predator. It's always, oh, look how cute he is. Do you see any ways that trans men are actually sexualized as men, or do they always disappear into the void of also ran men who don't quite measure up to the masculine ideal? Yeah, that's a good question. In instances of um, particularly, again, the fetishization that I would describe as derivatization, 
Um, a lot of times the like fetishizing trans men is coming from people who kind of have this idea in their minds of what a trans man should be. And that idea is different from what they see real man as real men as being. And I think that that's why like, like all forms of fetishization, derivatization, it feels invalidating um, to us when people are attracted to us for reasons that, um, that do not coincide with how we understand ourselves or how we want to be seen or treated. Um, so yeah, I think that uh, I don't know specifically about, um, I think it's quite possible to find trans men attractive as men um, without kind of like it being about like the focusing or fetishizing on the trans aspect of it. But I think, I think that usually when people are fetishized, they're usually fetishized for the way that they're different from the norm. Um, so I think that men can be sexually attractive and desired as men. Um, trans men can be uh, desired as men, but I think when people do that, it's usually fetishization isn't usually a part of that because it's kind of more seeing them as they understand themselves, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I would say that I, I do, I wouldn't just, I would want to add in my personal experience sure. as yeah. uh, that uh, they ask, you know, do you see ways that trans men are actually sexualized as men? I know that in my personal experience, my, the kind of um, fear and or discomfort and or um, scrutiny or skepticism or vigilance that I feel and uh, with respect to men generally because of you know maybe my own issues but that I feel this very similarly regardless of whether a man is cis trans or otherwise that um, I feel like that in my experience it has I think that there's a lot of ways that folks you know could be could interpret people differently but I have I'm curious about you Julia like I have generally um, felt similarly about or about men, whether they are cis or trans. Yeah, I mean, I think for any given person, um, there'll be different experiences based upon your own experience. I in the okay in the chapter that I I talk about um, the kind of fetishization, derivatization, and I use a lot of my experiences as a trans woman. I talk about that there are kind of like two groups of people who find me attractive. And so one group is the idea, is the group that fetishize, fetishize me as a trans woman so that it's specifically the fact that I'm a trans woman. They don't really care about me as a whole person. They're just like focused on that one thing. And then there are other relationships I've had with people across, um, across various genders, trans and cis, um, men and women, binary, non-binary. Um, in those cases, they find me attractive sometimes because I'm trans or sometimes that's just a trait that I have that just happens to be along for the ride, but they, they see me as a whole person and understand me as a full complex person. And so, yeah, I, I've been in relationships with people who thought the fact that I was trans was hot, but they didn't reduce me to that as some other people do, right? So, and I think it'll be a little bit different for every other person. One aspect that the analogy I make in that chapter that was very useful for me in thinking through this is um, I happen to have freckles. I was way more freckly when I was a little bit younger. And so I used to have people all the time say, oh, I like your, your freckles. They're cute. They're sexy. And I was like, oh, thanks. And then other people didn't really care about my freckles. And if I mentioned it, they'd be like, oh, yeah, you know, that's who you are. You know, you have freckles, whatever. And that didn't bother me at all because I'm not stigmatized in my daily life because of the fact that I have freckles. And when people dated me, no one is accused of being a freckle fetishist, right? It did it. So um, I kind of think that that's kind of useful in thinking about this. And I think seeing, being attracted to a trait that a person has isn't bad in and of itself if you see them as whole people um, and don't let that one trait be the sole thing that you're attracted to or read really bad stuff in or invalidating ideas into that. There are two 
questions that I think get into more depth on exactly what you were just talking about, um, which are kind of more practical. Like, well, how do you do that? How do you avoid derivatization? And so I'm going to read both of them because I think they're very similar. Um, one person asks, what advice do you have about overcoming internalized misogyny when trying to figure out what you truly want in, a sex in sexual relationships apart from what's been conditioned culturally and societally? And another question is very similar. Well, what would be the difference between expressing a sexual desire, usually towards a specific person, and sexualizing that person? Or where would the line be? So I guess they're both kind of like, well, how do you how do you express sexual desire without falling into the trap of sexualization or derivatization or of with inadvertently, I guess, playing along with the script without realizing it? Yeah. Um, so I think the a good a good difference between like kind of sexuality and and, and sexualization, as, as we were talking about before, I think consent is very much involved. And I think that if you um, if you were to like specifically be attracted to someone because of some aspect of themselves, um, and if you if if you did that in a very non-consensual way, then that would be bad. That would be sexualization. If I like just if I didn't know you and I just blurted out my sexual fantasy of, about you to you, or if I tried to um, kind of you know make you like have to like fit into my sexual fantasy these are all aspects of non-consensuality and therefore like they go um they veer towards the realm of sexualization um i think if you're in a consensual relationship with someone and you have you kind of share those ideas you know whatever oh this this turns me on or would you consider maybe like trying this or whatever um i think that then that can just be expressions of sexuality and those can be fraught for instance since we're just talking about like the fetishization idea um if someone specifically found the fact that i was trans hot and they were like would you be okay if we played this and it was something that kind of emphasized the fact that i was trans that could be something that i maybe wouldn't like or it could be something that i would be into um and that is something that like people in a relationship can negotiate right um but it can be hard and especially if you want something that the other person doesn't or or you desire them for ways that they don't want to be desired then there's like definitely conflict and, and problems there um uh with regards to the other question about um about overcoming like internalized misogyny. Um, yeah, th that's a hard question. That's usually every person I think has their own journey. I talk about mine through it, kind of how I went from feeling stigmatized both as for being trans and queer, but also because of misogynistic stigma, because I grew up in a in a world where like boys are better than girls and women are only good for one thing. And that very much messed me up as far as um, like internalizing that and then wondering, well, what is it that it means that I want to be a woman? What does it mean that for me to like, you know, be sexual with someone where I'm in the female role, given that we live in this culture? And what does it mean as a trans person, you know, kind of with that experience? That that's all stuff that like that's like, you know, 20 years of of working on myself i think people might come to different conclusions about what they're comfortable with um but i definitely do think that overcoming um stigma um is definitely possible um and i think that there are different paths that we can each take to get there and i do talk about some of that in the book um a little bit more in depth than that but yeah yeah i guess the only there's no like Pat, like step by step method to, to overcome internalized oppressive beliefs, you know, but it the only thing that we can say for sure, probably, is that it has to be intentional. Like if you don't try, then by default, you're probably just gonna revert to whatever the society wants you to believe.
about people and what's legitimate and what's illegitimate and what's the right way to be sexual and what's the wrong way and that kind of thing. Would you agree yeah. with that, Julia? Yeah, I, I would definitely agree. And I, I think that this, the intentionality that you just talked about is definitely ties in with the idea of self-examining desire, like making a point of, I'm going to work through this myself and critically think about what it is that I desire and what, are, what does this mean in society? And is this something that I shouldn't do or something that I can do, but under certain circumstances or in a particularly like negotiated consensual relationship, et cetera, yeah. Well, we have time for one final question. Um, and that is from Kel. And uh, Julia, this person is asking if your perspectives have shifted much since your earlier work, and if so, how? That's a very good question. Um, the thing that immediately comes to mind is that I, I would say yes. Um, particularly when I was writing my first book, Weapon Girl, um, I was admittedly very trans focused in writing that book. Um, and it's fine to focus a little bit more on, you know, I, I really wanted to talk about not just my experiences as a trans person, but also as a trans woman and, and talk about trans misogyny. And so it's very focused specifically on one marginalized group or and, and how they overlap with other adjacent and related and other marginalized groups. But um, I was really focused on like understanding prejudice against trans female and feminine people and trans people more generally. Over time, and then my second book excluded, I kind of was, I talk a little bit more about biphobia and femphobia um, and the connections there and the parallels that I saw with kind of transphobia and trans misogyny. And I think over time, I've gotten more and more interested just in general in how prejudice works. And specifically, like a lot of the mindsets I talk about in this book, um, and, and a lot of the thinking through this particular problem of sexualization came out of me trying to understand uh, kind of a lot of the unconscious ways in which we tend to project double standards on other people, to take two different groups and view them differently for some reason or the other. And I think my more general interest in kind of that phenomenon really helped me in this book be able to connect the dots between different forms of sexualization faced by um, different marginalized groups, which all these marginalized groups have talked about, but a lot of times um, it might be the sexualization of people of color would be kind of folded into racism, which it obviously is impacted by racism, or kind of like sexualization of trans people might just be described as transphobia. And I was very interested in looking at these these similar underlying patterns and how they play out for different groups and so that is one of the major main ways in which uh kind of my thinking about these issues have shifted kind of looking at wanting to look at a more general um how prejudice is working more generally rather than how it affects a particular group even though it is most certainly very important for people to be talking about how particular forms of marginalization impact specific groups but um, I describe them in the book as one is top down and one is bottom up, but they're both complementary and they're both important ways of looking at the world. Um, thank you so much for that answer. Um, that is going to be the end um, of the question and answer portion and of this conversation. I want to say thank you so much, Julia, for having this conversation with me. Um, and I also want to say thank you so much for writing this excellent book. Um, and with that, um, I am going to, uh, I want to bring back Alex to say good night. Thank you all so much for attending today. We hope you'll join us for more of our upcoming talks and workshops. This conversation was recorded. So if you'd like to watch it again, or you want to share it with your community, it will be available here on our YouTube channel at this same link and later on our Facebook page. We will also be featuring this talk on our podcast, which you can find at ciispod.com or by searching CIIS 
public programs on your favorite podcast app. Thank you again for joining us and have a wonderful evening. Thank you.